one story from Finland. It comes from one family, passed down orally for the most part, but there is a written language to it. And this is the root language that comes with this story. And the root language is, well, that's that's a tangent on it's in itself. So we'll go there. But yeah, the story is, like you said, it's a creation story. But what's interesting about it, and I guess, yeah, this language is that it's kind of, it self-checks itself. This language is built out of logic in some way, in a sense that the story fact-checks itself in a way it's very interesting basically it's a story of mankind and how we came to be according to this man eeyore bach and supposedly his family lineage and it, yeah it's quite different than what we're used to but at the same time when you suspend your disbelief and you kind of look at what it's presenting and then you look at other parts of history we're just naturally seeing the connections from place to place to place as we go it's very intriguing whether it's completely true or not it has a lot a lot there to be discovered still i would say it's a it seems to be a living saga a living language Welcome to the One on One Podcast with your host, Juan Ayala. Podcast is it the deep chill? The deep yeah, chill. yeah. Well, the deep chill is. Uh, well, the deep chill is our show, Dan. So you and I are the deep yeah. chill, as in our Patreon show. Yes, but I'm Andy from the deep share. Yeah. So Andy from the deep share, and then Dan Unaki Dan from Rising from the Ashes. I still like Romy better, but sometimes you got to put up with Dan because he's fucking Dan. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> just fucking with you, yeah. bro. You're like the. I hear that a lot. You're like the opposite of Romy, dude. You're like the chill, like stoic. Hey, man, what's going on? And then Romy's on a thousand fucking percent the whole time. It's hyperactive. How do you? Where'd you yeah. guys even meet? Where'd that dynamic even come up? You know what I mean? Like, where'd you, you guys meet on Tinder or something? Grinder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, he called into the higher side chats and left a, a video a voice message on there and at the time i had like already started to try to get this rising from the ashes podcast going with like a co-worker and uh we did an episode together and he the co-worker bailed out and didn't want nothing to do with it so i was kind of on the lookout for somebody that might want to uh join me and and do the show with me and so, like, about five or six months later down the road, uh, I was listening to uh, Greg Harwood, the Higher Side Chats. Uh, he did, like, a joint sessions show, and uh, Roman was on there, and uh, he was just talking about how he likes space and stuff, and he, he would love to do a podcast or something. And uh, I liked his energy, and it's not the same as mine, and uh, I felt like it would be a good... Uh, yin and yang situation so i hit him up and asked him if he would like to uh do the show with me and uh we talked for probably about two or three months and shared some ideas and then uh and then we're like let's let's do it then let's go let's start so we uh we started with uh 50 conspiracy questions to ask your normie friends uh because we didn't know where we're gonna go yet with uh the content and we wanted to get guests but we wanted to have something already there and so that ended up being like three episodes long and then um and then we were able to start getting some low-key guests and then 
better and better and better, and then here we are now. Hell yeah, dude. Oh, I'm glad I met you guys. I forgot how I met you. No, I met you through all media, so that's awesome. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Andy, you're a first timer on the show. Dan's already been on. Yeah. Romy's been on. What's up, dude? I know we met on that Atlanta Thanks. show. That Atlanta show was pretty amazing that Dan hosted. That was awesome. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, it's good to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm deep share. I've been doing it for like a year and a half. And yeah, I was compelled, man. I just was driven into to it finally after being a podcast fan for so long and being a person that had all this shit in my head for decades, just wanted to talk about it with no one around. So, you know pretty cliche story at this point but hey it's how, how i got here so yeah i've been doing it ever since oh uh, where can people find you on instagram youtube all that stuff instagram and twitter is the deep share and yeah i'm on youtube um with the deep share podcast and odyssey same thing and uh yeah, I do have a Rockfin page, but I haven't put anything on it. I don't even know if I will. So I seem to have quite a few followers over there, but it's like, eh, it's, they're wasting their time. But um, but yeah, I do have a Patreon too, so you can find me on there. Patreon slash The Deep Share. And uh, Rising from the Ashes has a Patreon as well, right? It's a uh, Rising FT Ashes. Yeah. So that and uh, That's right. Anunnaki. YouTube channel that Roman's been working on, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I told him to start pumping up the YouTube channel and all that good stuff. We're working on some interesting stuff because whenever we get together, it's always some crazy. He he pushed me to start looking into like my own backyard, like almost like a Michael Wan type of thing, you know, the occult origins of yeah, yeah. Florida. He really kicked that off because he hit me up when he was in town. He's like, "Bro, this place is crazy, man." I'm like, "I know, dude. I fucking <laughs> live here, bro." <laughs> So we started doing that, and, and the dude, the people that started listening to that, this, it's like a series that we're putting together. They were like, "Dude, this is fucking amazing!" So all right, we're gonna get together again on July thirteenth on the Interverse podcast, and we're gonna live stream it. I hate live streaming, so we're gonna get there and, and live stream it. So check that out. Hopefully, this will be out before that. Yeah. But yeah, guys. So we're gonna be talking about the box saga, aka the cock saga. I. I needed to get that off my chest. I'm sorry. Hey. <laughs> hey, it rhymes. It's nice. We like All right. It's going to stay on your chest and all deep down your throat. Oh. I needed to get that off my... I've been holding it the whole day, bro. I'm sorry. I was like, am I going to say it? Yeah. I'm going to say it. So it is another pretty much a story of creation. Now, it's very interesting because the first time that I had you on the show... Dan, we had you, you know, we stayed after and we had talked for a little bit. And you're like, oh, look into this and to this and to this. And so I've looked into it. I've listened to enough. I mean, I listened to the guy on the higher side chats. I listened to you guys' episode on Mark's feed. I listened to the deep chill episode. So I have a background pretty much. But for the people who've never heard of it, can you get like in a, like a, the layman's, Nut the nutshell? <laughs> summary of what the box saga is roughly because i know we're not going to have enough time to get into the whole thing but it's very long right it is it's a long one uh yeah it's one story from finland it comes from one family uh passed down orally for the most part um but uh there is a written language to it and this is the root language that comes with this story and the root language is, um, well, that's that's a, a tangent on its in itself, so we won't go there. But, um, but yeah, the story is like you said, it's a creation story. Um, but what's interesting about it, and I guess yeah, this language is that it's kind of uh, it self checks itself. This language is um, built out of logic in some way, in a sense that the story fact checks itself in a way it's very interesting but we can get into that a little further down the road but basically it's a story of mankind and how we came to be according to this man eeyore bach and supposedly his family lineage and it's uh yeah it's quite different than what we're used to but at the same time uh you know when you suspend your disbelief and you kind of look at what it's presenting and then you look at other parts of history like dan and i are trying to do on the deep chill we're just naturally seeing the connections from place to place to place as we go. So it's, it's, it's very intriguing whether it's completely true or not. 
it has a lot, a lot there to be discovered still. I would say it's a, it seems to be a living saga, a living language. And what year did he come up with it? What year was that at? He released it to the world in 1984, in July of 1984, to a group of friends in mm-hmm. Goa, India. It's recent as fuck. It is. It's very weird how yeah. recent it is, you know. <laughs> but uh, apparently, from what Eeyore says, said, and his uh, his Bacchist followers have said, is that this story goes back far further than we can imagine and to suspend disbelief is probably important to do for this story just because there's a lot of truth in there there's a lot of interesting places we can take it afterwards but there's a lot of ridiculous intensely mythological feeling stuff too where it's like okay well that's a completely different crazy than all the other crazy that i've heard throughout religion so it's like throwing you for a loop again but it's if you suspend disbelief, it's very interesting what we find. Yeah, because I had a theologian on last week, and I said, what's the difference between a religion and a cult? And he laughed, and he said, not much. Because if you really think about it, <laughs> it's like, dude, it's the they have fought in the church over which bread they wanted to use for the Eucharist. Like There have been wars over that shit. And that is a religion that I can answer your question. Go ahead. What is it? What do you, what, what, what's your. A religion is oriented towards Christ and uh, a cult is heathen. Oh, well, how about all the other religions that in some sense is not in like some of the newer cults. I don't know. Well, there's a good reason why we find such similarities between all the other religions and Jesus's story and all that. I mean, you can connect those, you know, uh, anecdotally, but also I think on a deeper level too, that that would make sense still. The word cult comes from the Celtics. Yes. And religion, according to Bach Saga, comes from this idea that we'll get too much later that is that these people were re-legioning the world, which is phonetic. Re-legioning cool. the world. So let's get into it. So how does it start? Is there one central figure? Is there many central figures? Is there seven guys, seven main guys? Because that's usually <laughs> all these religions. Seven islands. So there is seven islands? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I picked seven. up on that early, too. I was like, ooh, seven. There it is. There's the seven. Seven and, uh, sages. Yeah. Uh, Dan, do you want to start man. or should I? With like the story itself, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll I've take never it. talked about this on uh, the show, by the way. Uh, so, the first time ever, <laughs> you're in the for world, it. <laughs> the world was in ball lance. It was a ball with a lance going through it, and it was straight up and perpendicular. There was no tilt. This was known as the paradise time. This is when it was sun equally on the whole planet and of course you still have night and day and at this point in time everybody on the earth was dark skinned or had brown skin uh, very melanated then the ice age happened and when the ice age happened the earth tilted and it caused uh, the North Pole to become encapsulated in ice. And this is where we get the term alt East or Atlantis uh, for other people. And what it means is all land ice. So all the lands were covered in ice. So that's England, Scotland, Ireland, Poland. There was actually, a, I think, a Daneland um couldn't have been a Dane land yet, but something like that. There's all these lands surrounding it, and it created an ice wall, which encapsulated these people that were in the north. And then um, because they were stuck there in the north in the colder climates, they developed blue eyes and blonde hair uh, or red hair. Uh, They basically started to lose the melanin in their skin. And it went into other places that that energy went somewhere else. 
So, so now you have a, a group of Nordic people living in an ice wall, uh, sort of similar to Game of Thrones, you know, I was about but to not say as that. like undead or anything, <laughs> but not undead. And uh, so you have the, these people living up there and then they, there's all kinds of traditions and all types of other things uh, maybe that Andy wants to hit on that happened yeah. during this Ice Age time. Well, let's, I think maybe to pull back to Paradise time a little bit would probably be, be good just to yeah. explain uh, and where this Atlantis atlantis connection can kind of be found in modern theories too. You know, it's uh, all about the concentric rings, right? We attribute this to Atlantis and how it was set up and how it was constructed. This supposedly comes from Bach Saga because when the before the Earth was tilted, supposedly, according to the saga, Helsinki was at the very North Pole. And at the time, it was just called Hell. And Hell was seven islands around this main pole. And supposedly this is where we get mathematics from. They watch the shadow of the sun around this North Pole. Um, and they I can't remember the exact saying, but they have a saying that explains it in the language of how it got to math. But it's pretty interesting. But anyway, hell was the North Pole. And real quick, so Andy, instead of a yeah, go this ahead. is in which geographical part of the world? This is in Finland, right? Swedish. Finland, Swedish. Right. So, Sweden, so Scandinavia, yeah. yeah, Finland. And if you picture before the, the uh, earth was rotating on its axis, like it is now, if you picture it straight up and down in ball ants, uh, balance, uh, Finland or Helsinki would be mm -hmm. where roughly where it is. Um, so that's where this story takes place. This, these heathen people in this perfect garden in the North called hell. So right away, we can see a lot of inversion from what we understand about our language when in terms of the occult and and uh, and religion and everything where this hell comes from, possibly. And to them, this hell, the word meant balance or complete or home heaven, basically. So that's what we have mm -hmm. in paradise time. We have this. Now, remember, everyone is the same family all across the earth. This were peopled out from the north. This Helsinki, this hell, is where the first people called the Acer were living. And from there, there that's like where the All Father is. And from there, it all the whole system spreads out in concentric rings, supposedly all over the earth at that time. But when this Altland East time happened. When the, the earth tilted for whatever cataclysmic reason, which who knows, may line up with what others say about an impact, perhaps. Um, when this happened, because of the Gulf Stream supposedly taking this weird route up there because of all the ice forming, uh, they say that it would it formed what they called a rosette or like an infinity loop where the warm waters and warm temperatures were perfectly set up to stay in this area. So this hell, even though it, it's no longer the North Pole, it's tilted down to like the 32 degree line or something like that. It's now suddenly encapsulated in this ice wall, as Dan was saying. So it's like protected, ironically, and they were able to survive, say, thousands of years, hundreds of thousands, I don't know how long, but imagine the rest of the world, the rest of the Northern Hemisphere, at least, wherever these, the Ice Age impacted the Earth, everyone else was barely surviving, I can assume. So when we do get to this part of the deluge, the second Ragnarok, according to Bog Saga, when all the ice starts to melt, we kind of start getting into the deluge stories that we are familiar with. But if we consider this to be the precursor, then it fills in a lot of interesting holes. And it also forces us to kind of re-examine the words and the names of people in these flood stories, what they represented, where the symbolism is, because if it's going back to goats and things like that, which of course we all know is considered very evil by the Catholic church and it represents all these bad things. But of course it, in this story, it goes back to the creation of man, which in this wild story is the mating of 
an ape and a goat. And that is supposedly what brings on the first two humans, Frey and Freya. And these two humans were born in this hole in this North Pole at the time of Par- the beginning of Paradise time. And this hole was considered holy. And they use that phonetically throughout. I know it sounds kind of silly. What the fuck? At first, it sounds it sounds like the word magic you hear often. But then when you start to get into it, this rhyming, this pun like phonetic behavior is everywhere. And it's actually how Dan and I have been kind of seeing how things connect from culture to culture. And while etymology completely accepts that phonetics are a very strong indicator of where things go and where things come from, something like this, we've never had an etymologist really look at, to my knowledge. And that's what we're, we're trying to do, too. All right. So let's recap here a little bit. So we have Atlantis, all land ice, right? And it was, I've heard this before, where there is a cap, right, where it's capped, and it's cap. It's always like, what's it capping then? If it's, if it's a cap, right? The, they say it's the entrance to Hollow Earth, or you know, they say it's the a portal to another dimension, and that's why the UN has a picture of the above from the North Pole looking down, the Draco constellation, mm. and all that good stuff. Now, in this cosmology, that's another reason for the. Uh- that's another reason for the serpent people is because the Draco constellation was right above their head in the north. Exactly. And and that could also be why they put the fucking serpent up here. You know what I mean? That could also... Cause... And also, not to cut in again, but the vortex as well that you're speaking of is also mentioned in box saga lore as well. And supposedly Jim Chesner like, showed it on film. I mean, you can't really see anything, but it's supposedly the utter North Pole and is residing underneath a Catholic chapel mm-hmm. on us on an island in uh, south of finland isn't there a movie about that where they break through the ground of a old church and they go isn't that descent two or something like that where there's like an underground civilization oh, that sounds kind of like uh, as above so below or it might be that one actually was it found footage uh maybe but i'm pretty sure it was like they were at a church the ground it was built on top of this hole the hell you know hell hole or something i don't know if it was that one actually but in this cosmology, is it a flat earth or is it a round earth or is it agnostic? Like, where do they stand as far as the shape of the the earth? For Box Saga, it's a sphere. It's a sphere. It's a ball because it's in ball lands. And I know that sounds a little circumstantial, but yeah, as we continue, it kind of becomes more clear that the phonetics play a huge role. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a sphere. And it would make sense that because we know that there was supposedly – Allegedly, right? The mainstream history says that there was a land bridge between Alaska and what is it, Russia, Asia, where people crossed mm-hmm. crossed over from there. And oh yeah, it would make sense if the Earth was tilted more up. It was that entire place was frozen. And, I, and I've always said this. I've they always say that Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent is where civilization started. I go, well then what the fuck was happening in the States, like in North America and South America? Was there like nobody, nobody was there. It was only Mesoamerica and all these other places that or Mesopotamia and all these other places and ancient Sumer, Iraq that really kicked everything off. Like that never made sense to me. No, I would say, you know, mess, uh, Mesoamerican cultures were going on pretty close to to those time periods as well. Maybe a little bit sooner, right? Like maybe by a thousand years. I know it's a lot relatively, but not too far off from the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Inca. How they get? They were all worshiping. They and that's the thing. They were all worshiping. Like if you look at Kukulkan, you look at Viracocha and Quetzalcoatl, all of the, and you look at the Hopi's shining ones. You look at all these Sumerian. references and the Sumerian, yeah, the Anunnaki, which ties into the uh, Tuatha de Anu and then over to Ireland and Scotland with the Tuatha de Danan. It's all the and it's all these mythologies about these white strangers, these yes. white people, basically. I mean, I've connected recently this whole, you know, I was watching Game of Thrones again because I'm like, I'm going to find tons of gems. I'm going to find shit about Tartaria with the Targaryens, <laughs> but the ice and the free folk. That's going to be interesting. And of course, free folk, fair folk, fey folk, Mm -hmm. white folks, Mm -hmm. and all of this Mm -hmm. history that has been demonized by 
the Catholic church over, you know, from the beginning of this, uh, you know, it's just completely written over everything. So we have, yeah, I would say, think of the, I'll go ahead. Yeah. I just want to do a quick recap because you keep getting fucking sidetracked, which is, it's fine. But <laughs> so we have the Atlantis and then you said it formed a wall. So that's how we get the, the typical Atlantis concentric circles of, well, the concentric circles are yeah. in the city, the structure of the, the civilization itself in all over the world. These ringlands all over the, would, were yeah. all over the Whoa. place in paradise time. So these ringlands are signatures of what we call Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And I can give plenty of credit to uh, the, you know, the, the whole story that we have from Solon mm -hmm. and, and all these descriptions on the walls of this war between the Atlanteans and all that eventually this was this name stuck obviously this was a place but it was only a place like the only time it was said all land is ice is in this place that was kept unfrozen because everybody else is dead and they can't even utter that mm -hmm. name so they're the ones talking about it so i guess it is kind of a place and a time period interesting what were you gonna say dan i forgot <laughs> i do that because you know because you <laughs> what really piqued my interest was when you said okay we have the deluge which is i've heard this before where the fall of atlantis is either symbolic or literal in this case it's literal when the ice melts and and it washes over everything which would make a lot of sense and that could play into tartaria with the mud flood and all these things but i was i was googling here because i'm trying to find a reference to atlantis in the bible right off the top of my head and for some reason jericho came into my mind right because they were uh -huh. circling jericho the beginning over and over genesis what would you say would be the atlantis the garden of eden you think was atlantis yes yeah the garden, noah's ark the garden well that's uh that's new yard that's where they went afterwards right that's the noah's ark story in box saga yeah yeah they were noah's ark <laughs> is them leaving right them leaving because of the ice or yeah the ice melting but um just to go back to juan can you ask your question again <laughs> we are distracted <laughs> <laughs> well, I forgot what my question was. I I was so mm. Dan said the Genesis story has the Atlantis, oh, yeah. which is I'm trying to find the you know the correlations with the concentric circles. And if you look up Jericho, it shows you know these concentric circles around the area. And they they talked about how they circled mm. the walls yeah. until they fell. So it's again, it's a very weird thing to be doing. You know, circling the walls. Like why would you, is it was mm. it a circle? And you were trying to knock it down to to penetrate the barrier, you know, further inside. So. It's very interesting because we we know, again, I had this uh, Dr. Joseph Lumpkin on, and he said, one man's myth is another man's religion. And then when he fucking said oh, that, I was yeah. like, oh, my God, that's fucking amazing. That, that makes perfect sense. And there's this cross-pollination of religions from, you know, it starts with ancient Sumer, where they're the ones that paved the road for all religions, because the oldest literature that we have is the Epic of Gilgamesh. It, it, obviously, if I'm sure there's older things than that, but that's the only one that's been preserved pretty much. But they really paved the way for everything else. So <laughs> the way he put it was, you know, all the religions of today are probably due to some like hillbilly Canaanite one day that was like, you know what? Let's build this fucking statue that looks like a dog and let's sacrifice our kids to it. It's like, whoa, 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 chill out, dude. And then the other people over there didn't want to sacrifice their kids to Moloch. So then they formed their own denomination and so on and so forth, bro. So this this is a touchy subject. For this me. is definitely touchy, but yeah. So what, uh, because a lot of this stuff is the symbols that we see are have been to totally, completely just... inverted um, mutilated from inverted yeah is another good word well, from what yeah. they originally were to represent because when you look at what the actual representations are you can see where the flip happened and a lot of these things have nothing to do with blood sacrifices or anything like that it had to do with a different type of sacrifice or offering which was of fluids bro you buy <laughs> that though because sexual because i've heard about that so now, one of the main, one of my my fields of study, if you will, is alchemy, right? And we see it in alchemy all the time. 
You know, this whole monkey and goat business. All over. Wh- whose seed was it that came up with the humans? Was it a human that like a dude join in or was it the goat and the monkey? The goat. It was the combination of the two, the goat, supposedly. Well, I'm sorry. The goat go was ahead. the female. The goat was, yeah. The goat was the female. You know, yeah. nanny goat. you know where else you see that, though? Because you see this in the, the Renaissance grimoires. You see it where mm-hmm. there is, for example, the homunculus, which in this case, it would be a fucking mm-hmm. homunc- a chimera. I don't fucking know. It would be a form of a homunculus because they use the vagina of a goat or a cow or whatever thing or a a container with the seed, with the sperm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the grimoires are? What it means? Uh, no, but I heard you on Grim, on a show. Grim. Oh, you yeah. did? Grim is another name for Odin. Uh, and so the grimoires are like the words of Odin. Interesting. Odin is the, Odin is the sun in Box Saga, but it's said as Odin. Uden. That's the sun and it's the life giving, the energy giving. It's it's all of that. It's sun worship. It's the beginning of sun worship. Red flags. <laughs> but like this is what I'm saying though, is is it's been so diluted down to oh, yeah. what we know as Odin and everything that it's hard to like kind of go back up to what it originally was because you just it just starts to get watered down and then it turns into all of these deity type mm-hmm. gods. But it was never actually like that. It was basically just sun and moon. And that was it. And God meant good. So, because, yeah. yes, you do, we do get into, I forgot what they called it, but we, when you anthropomorphize something where you turn into a human, right? You turn into a, a being. In the upper eons for the Gnostic cosmology, it's uh, just a, a being of light. They were, they were emanationists, so the source emanates out reality. Now, when it comes to these sorts of stories, it's what's his reasoning be, by them taking so long to get this out? Like, what was his reasoning behind it? The the one main guy. Why did he wait till the eighties or whatever it was to to come out with this idea? To come out with this creation? Did he give a reason for that? 10,000 years or a 1,000 years? Yeah, it was a 1,000 years, right? Or two, I don't remember. It was a certain amount of time that he was, that the family was keeping it amongst themselves because they were originally being hunted by the Catholics. And we can get into the destruction of Udinma by the Catholic Church. But beyond that, into our history, his story, we have them basically trying to avoid being seen. And isn't it interesting that in a lot of popular cultural movies and phenomenons and stuff like that. We have that theme about the Jesus line. Mm -hmm. We have the Da Vinci code and everything. And with the mocking tongue that we know so well from the entire elite class and whatever they really represent, we see the mock, the, the mock everything all the time. And this, that's a lot of what we see here is Dan and I were talking before the show about how, you know, this supposed, uh, lemon kind in temple that is a storehouse where the Bach, family stored all the treasure and hid it so the world could find out someday like we've talked about like what if it was already raided and what if all the amazing jewels and sculptures that we see that we're looking at all this symbolism going holy shit it connects back to box yeah what if it was already raided and they're just fucking hijacking it all and saying telling their own stories you know because that that's a possibility i mean if you really come to think about it the Council of Nicaea, right? Let's talk about Christian or Catholicism. Yeah. The Council of Nicaea decided what was canonical and what was not. But I always go, how can you prove those books are what people say it is? It's an egregore. Excuse me. It was. It's an egregore. At the end of the day, it just it's something that so many people have poured their intention behind that it picks up and just runs and it just becomes its own thing. Not saying that Jesus didn't exist. Not mm-hmm. saying any of that. But I'm saying that these t- sort of things, it's like a, a Rocco's Basilisk where it becomes a thing later on in, in, in the future. You know what I mean? Like it creates mm. itself. It's a self-creating thing once you have something that takes off. Because it's like you have all these Gospels. But then it's like what makes the difference between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nakamadi? Why is that not canon? Oh, because it's too Gnostic and it 
But it's like, it's stories. It's it's amazing stories. Gos- the gospel of Judas is crazy. This is a shape-shifting Jesus in that motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like a, <laughs> a interdimensional Jesus. It's my favorite Jesus out of all the Jesus, the, the interdimensional gospel of Judas, where he tells the, the yeah. disciples, he's like, I just don't fucking like you guys pretty much. I went to another time. And they're like, wait, what, what, what do you mean? He's like, you guys are worshiping the wrong God. Like he tells it in this story, he's like, you guys are worshiping the wrong one. I'm not, I'm not him. You know what I mean? I'm just here to to spread the love and spread the truth. And I can show you guys the secrets, but you guys need to stop, like pretty much stop worshiping me. Like I'm not the I'm not your guy. So again, I think a lot of these things An avatar. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. An avatar. Like Christos. like Krishna and Vishnu and all these guys. So mm-hmm. we have this city. Concentric circles is everywhere. There's a flood. Uh, before that, there was the monk, well, Ice Age, the yeah. monkey and the goat, and then humans came through. <laughs> was there like an Adam and Eve type of thing going on too? Or? That would be that would be Frey and Frey. Well, oh yes, yeah, yes, the two, Frey. the two. So because because of this flood and it wiping everybody out, they said that at this period is when this union was able to happen because it's not normal. It's not something that always happened. Like it. You know, apes saying go around screwing goats all the time. That this happened at a specific point because it needed to happen for for humanity to keep existing, for life to still be going. It had to take effect. So yeah, I wouldn't say humanity was because this was to... the beginning of humanity, but for life to continue because it is yeah, a very yeah. pagan. Yeah. It's the the roots of heathenism and paganism, which is naturalism at, at its core. It's, you know, so what I would say, and this is just me, that their idea of humanity is just like a tree having fruit come out of it. Like we were coming and this is how it happened, supposedly. So that's kind of how to frame that. But the Atlant, the flood shit. uh, Yeah, we could get into like the Nephilim stuff. Yeah, I was going to say what sort of mythological creatures or byproducts were there? If there was any angels, is there anything of that nature in this? Mm. Angels and angle go back to the same root word. (laughs) Yeah, it means it comes from a gale, which is like a bull that runs in a circle. So (laughs) there's you have a circle connotation to angle. And uh, then you have Stonehenge and you have all these circular built structures everywhere. You have arches. So then an angle angle becomes Anglo later. So an archangel or an archangel or an archangel. Anglo from the Arctic. Caucasian from, from the Arctic circle. Yeah, the arc is there with also with architecture and all that. I'm, tr- I'm but, trying um, to, when it comes to I'm trying to desensitize yeah. and and de how do I say it cuz I've you know de de indoctrinate because I'm I'm trying to really open my mind to visualize these things as you guys are going along. <laughs> right, I know and it's hard we do jump around. It's 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 a difficult story to to lock down for sure. <laughs> There's a lot to it. There's so but, much nuance to it and uh just the words too. You'll say a word. I'll go. Oh, there we go. There's another yeah. thing I can die. There's about. another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, just like the like I forgot to say earlier. It's just it, I get a kick out of it. It's just like a pun kind of at this point. But it's like the idea of when hell freezes over, and we're literally talking about a story where hell was the only place that wouldn't freeze. So it's kind of it's like oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's there's a lot of those in this the inversions of everything because like i said the goat it's usually the lamb because it's pure and <sighs> sacred and then the monkey is kind of uh what the fuck like <laughs> why the monkey is it because it's is it closest to us like again it's like a failed experiment type of thing it's a chimera you know what i mean it's a homunculi <laughs> Well, we came out of it supposedly and what's interesting is that the dominating scientific idea is evolution that we came from apes right so it's interesting to note that the goat is once again suppressed just like all of paganism and all of heathenism what if it were to go that far what if evolution is on the right path it's pretty much close but when it comes to us 
we are a mutation of these two different animals, but they've suppressed every bit of symbolism to do with that older world. So they have to also take it out of the evolution. But, for, you know, maybe that's why people find so many holes in evolution. And they go, well, we can't really figure it out. You know? So history repeats itself. This, there's a there was a suppression of women in history mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. If you if you go back, the goddess dies. Uh, they start killing witches and burning, you know, female bad type of scenario. So yep. you can see it repeat in the same same type of way. And I don't know if you ever heard it before, but there is like a a, a thing about um, monkeys and pigs. Mm-hmm being uh uh being like the hybrid of what humans are because of our skin and how how it is and how many different things we have similar with pigs but pigs are also in the same like genus species as a goat they're both part of the hoof uh family of uh, i forget what it's i forget what it's called but they are in the same family line um so we could be going to the pig but maybe we're just not going back far enough. We could go all the way back to the goat. And it's interesting because right. Jesus casted the demons into the swine, into the pigs. And we have the scapegoat in Genesis, the sacrifice mm-hmm. to Azazel. Uh, the, and then there's a scapegoat that that's let out guilt, a goat that's let out into the, into the wilderness to, to symbolize the mercy of the God, you know, the one. And in this story, it's like, yeah, let's take that and make it why we're here. So I can see where it's, mm. again, an inversion of that. And do they say how many years How many years this took place over at all? Is there a figure that they give, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years? Do. It's like 50,000 years or something like, or maybe more. Million. Oh, a million? Yeah. Well, for yeah, for the, for paradise time, yeah, it is like that far back. I'm thinking like Atlantis. And there was a time before the ice too. Well, the time before the ice was yeah. uh, sorry. So this is easy to get jumbled. Paradise time, perfect climate all over the planet. Earth is balanced. The sun is going around in the north. It's going around 24 seven. Beautiful vegetation, massive garden, all that when the tilt happens and interestingly enough, I haven't looked into it too much, but the box saga claims that the entire galaxy tilted. And what's interesting Mm -hmm. is recently I've been seeing articles where people, they're not focused on that, but scientists are, they'll they'll mention something like that, that had happened a long time ago. So that's interesting having to do with like magnet magnetism and stuff like that. So who knows, but then the ice came. And that was supposedly the first time the ice had ever been, w- at least in terms of humans. Um, and even we interviewed Michelle Merle, who's Eeyore Bach's closest friend, and he's like the primary storyteller of the saga. Uh, he said that we're still in Atlantis. We're still in ice time because there shouldn't be any ice on the planet. Interesting. So where are we headed? Global warming. Oh, got to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it, like, it's like a new coming age of. Do they did they say what comes after this age at all? After Atlantis was his story, history. That's kind of how they yeah they put it together like that basically. I mean we can see how that happens because basically his story mm-hmm. starts with the destruction of Udenma mm-hmm. in Finland. So you know, and we can't necessarily we're trying to lock it down where like where we can find parallels from different, you know, accounted for history in that area at the time in 1050 that it claims to have happened when the Catholic church came to destroy everybody, the last remaining Acer people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, I think the last of the Gnostics was the Cathars and the church was just like, kill everybody, you know, everyone. And God will sort through his own. It's like women, children, the Gnostics, everybody was dead. And it's like, you have to, these, all these religions that people that are the mainstream religions are sometimes a lot of death cults. If you really think about it, it's like a, you know, if you really look at the, 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 the story behind JC, right. It's 
it's like a zombie dude it's like necromancy like he came back to life went to the to the underworld <laughs> fought for three days then rose again and was just walking around like what the fuck you know what i mean like it's crazy i'm convinced that the heathen the original heathen understanding and I, it's a, it is all about like this soul recycling mm-hmm. in a way where like our souls through this there's so much symbolism about trees and everything it, it all comes back but i mean i haven't read anything about what they say about like a quote unquote afterlife or anything like that to me the more naturalist view is that the ego the personality goes goes away and you know the energy itself flows back and that kind of seems like the overall lsd hippie mentality that is originally born in this archaic world of heathenism whereas you have possibly i i do see this in history we talk dan and i talk a lot about this breaking away from this old system Mm -hmm. and they talk about it in the saga in terms of like the parts of the civilization that left and started to mingle more with the rest of the world and this and that and then the seed gets weaker and so we have the nephilim story there it's interesting everybody we have to kill them we have to destroy them and all that but um Shit, I think I lost my train of thought. No, yeah, I was going the somewhere. Nephilim. <laughs> so you have the the parallel yeah, before that though. With that there, yeah, um, yeah. So I think what happened is that at some point on a on a philosophical level, there's a breaking away from this natural system of it's okay. We all just go back into the earth and all mm-hmm. that. And like, no, I want to live forever. I'm terrified of death this breaking away from this old way where everything was in order and everything worked, everything accepted reality for what it was and what they could feel and understand. There was a departure from that. And we see that depicted, and this is going a little off topic from saga itself, but we see it depicted everywhere in every movie, the, the departure of the, the child away from the, the home out into the world. And then eventually back in it's, it's this parable that's told over and over and over again. And it does seem like that with who's running the show right now and what their transhumanist goals are and possibly, you know, immortality and all that. It falls in line with this deep rooted fear that, as you know, we could explore these traumas go back and back and back generationally over and over and over again, could go back to this very simple philosophical divide, you know, in some ways. It, it's ingrained in our DNA. You know, all these fears that we have of, of when we were kids of the dark, that's our ancestors oh, yeah. when they were fucking battling si- saber tooth tigers in the middle of the night. <laughs> and they're like, man, I'm afraid <laughs> to fucking go to bed. It's dark out here. Mm. So it's been proven that Absolutely. these things, these ideas can be passed down genetically. Now, one interesting aspect, because we're talking about how these people lost their, what'd you say, their their skin tone and their eyes lined up and they were the typical Aryan pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I yeah. found it really interesting that, because the aliens that freak me out are like the Palladians where they're like, they look like the, mm-hmm. North, the, North. the Nordics, where it's yep. like these, a regular ass white dude. I've been <laughs> doing a deep dive into John D. And they're tall too. Do what? And they're tall. And they're tall, exactly. I've been doing a deep dive into John D. and uh, the D. Kelly workings and the descriptions that they give of the princes and the governors and the angels is eerily similar to these aliens that people describe how we're describing now with the blonde hair blue eyes like they would wear they would look like regular men with a robe and a, and a golden crown and of light complexion and of green eye. like this description i'm like were these dudes talking to fucking aliens you know when they were there he's <laughs> probably crying opening up a portal to another dimension it's like oh look at that it's a it's a palladian it's an alien you know they're telling us to fuck our wives like you fuck my wife i fuck yours and they're gonna mm. reveal the secrets but they were deep down inside they were just trolling the shit out of john d and edward kelly so it's like sounds like box saga <laughs> it sounds like they were talking to white people <laughs> but and, maybe they and, were talking to ancestors and not necessarily aliens yeah yeah because that's the thing too i mean i i find that we have a very mythologized 
history mixed with a very internal Mm -hmm. experience of God and things like that. And they know they, they, they know this so they can mix it all together. And I think that's one of our big, biggest points of like cognitive dissonance and confusion is what is literal? What is mythological? What is standing for something else? Things like that. But yeah, the, the imagine you say the word alien, imagine a race of people that were surviving and thriving in the only place in the Northern hemisphere that was allowing them to, to be fruitful for thousands and thousands of years and then thrown back into the mix with the rest of the world after the ice age, they would be super advanced. Mm -hmm. If you check out like HP Blavatsky too, her evolution of races it starts with the polarians and then to the hyperboreans and then i, I can't remember i think it's atlantis she had reptilians and in the there too the well oh, see really? and that goes into the the people of the serpent which leads to the twa the day Danan, which leads to the honor day anunnaki it's all talking about the mm-hmm. serpent is this acknowledgement of the cycles of nature mm-hmm. and this wisdom of it and that kind of coincides with the biblical story if you can look at the the snake the serpent in that way as well uh what does it expose adam and eve to it exposes them to the truth the cycles of the the real knowledge. the reality mm-hmm. i guess you could say yeah it's a knowledge of what's mm-hmm. going on to be like a god is to understand and when you understand you can kind of see patterns and the way things are going i always love that quote from mothman prophecies when he's like so are they gods and the experts like look at that window painter up there he's way up on a on a high rise he can see a little further down the road is he a fortune teller (laughs) it's about perspective (laughs) absolutely which and that's usually what's lost on us when we're trying to put these things together when we don't have all the pieces we lose perspective and you know, we've lost perspective on Saga, of course, too, because some I, we don't we can't confirm all of it at all. But some of it's just way too coincidental and intriguing. What's the more more ridiculous part of it, oh. uh, other than the goat and the monkey? Like, what's like what the? F- I mean, oh man, I would jump at the 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 offering system, of course, which would take a, probably a whole episode. Birds and the really, bees, the birds and the bees, and where that comes from, and and the. The weirdest part about Saga, just so your audience can hear it and can judge for themselves if they look into it, this these blood sacrifices, th- there is a time when it turned from the, the matriarch to the patriarch, when we went from the seed to the bloodline. And so before these blood sacrifices, what these are basically a parody of is this seed worship, this of this of semen, which supposedly is an energy coming directly from Udin, the sun, the life giver, the original one that is worshipped of the sun. So there's a lot of autophilatio and all kinds of weird traditions that modern humans would find really bizarre. Some would call some of these traditions like extremely polarizing and very, uh, dangerous to talk about you know uh so you have that and a lot of people we talk to are like you know that's a fake story or not a lot of people but we want more we want more uh debate of course but the people that do feel that way it seems more than not that they're turned off by all of that understandably so but what kind of annoys me personally is the fact that we've all, especially in the conspiracy world, have been totally okay with dick cults represented by the past everywhere, all over this play of fertility cults, giant dicks being erected all over the place. We just connect them to more modern stories. And it's just this shying away. Uh, if that's what's going on, then that I think is, is unfortunately intellectually bankrupt bankrupt. I think I can't remember what God in, in like Hindu mythology it was, but he said, everywhere you see a giant penis, you see me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, was that Vishnu? Well, I think it might have been, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Destroyer of worlds. <laughs> this is, this is where it gets a bit weird. I mean, if it hasn't already, but 
Yeah, this auto fully, what do you call it? I call it the Ouroboros or 69ing, which if we look at yeah. the, the Big Dipper and Little Dipper, I mean, you could say, you know, it's kind of the same thing. So when they were doing this stuff, mm. was it one dude that was getting his dick sucked or were they sucking each other's dick? Like, how does it work? What's the, how is the, what are the mechanics of the ritual? What do they include? Like the main. I would one. say that it kind of comes from a little bit of the Bible holds this true too, is that it's sacred and you're not supposed to just waste it. Right. And so it comes for, from the uh, East too. the East with the, you know, holding it in during mm-hmm. orgasm and all that. It It's around mm-hmm. everywhere. No. Yeah. And, and so for like the more self gratification, self gratification part, it's yourself. And then for the other part, it's, you know, something different. So it's, this is supposedly where they were getting their strongest humans because they were replenishing. And this is, I believe this could be hippie woo woo, or it could be a fact. I saw it somewhere that if you don't spill your seed, it does thing. It, it, it helps glands mm-hmm. and it, it replenishes the body with certain mm-hmm. things. So in that way, this story suggests that they were getting the strongest and, and most beautiful and most handsome. All this sounds again, like, Aryan angels. mythology. It, it sounds like angels. It also sounds like what mm-hmm. we say about these people are after the master race and shit like that. It's all similar. Yeah, and it's funny that in in the book of Enoch, the first thing that the that the angels smell is the me- Enoch semen. They go, "What is that mm. smell?" And it's <laughs> the semen of Enoch. And apparently, the Messiah could smell people out and tell like what they how they were like. Like I could just smell you, mm. and be like. Like a dog. Yeah, you're a piece of shit, bro, and you know you're a hu- horrible human being because I can just smell it on you. So, my whole thing is there is such thing. As, you know, you have the left hand path, right hand path. There is such thing as retention. There is such thing as magical masturbation, is what they call it. Uh, and oh, yeah. these sex, sex magic, and tantric sex magic, and all these things. The whole thing about orgasm and all these things is that you're connected to the universe. So it would make sense. Now, the eating of the semen, that, again, when it comes to a lot of these secret societies and these initiation rites and rituals, the more obscure and the more shocking it is, that's the whole point, to shock the initiate and shake them to their core, to desensitize them and take them away from what they normally know. For example, John D. and Edward Kelly, when the angel said, hey, you guys have to share everything, he's like, Everything, mm-hmm. everything, metaphorically or physically, in both ways. So he's like arguing with this angel back and forth. Like, yeah, hey, you have to share even your wives. And that was a shock to him, like, oh, my God, you know, what in the shock to the ego? Like, it's to <laughs> dissolve exactly to dissolve the ego. And once the ego is out of the way, you're able to manifest things in a quicker in a quicker manner. So. We have the auto fellatio, and I relate that to the Ouroboros because is the Ouroboros is the snake it's a part of eating it. its, uh, its uh, tail. And I also asked somebody the other day, I said, or is it regurgitating itself back out? There it is on the cover of the box yeah. saga. There you go. That's uh, it's also the wheel of life, too. The wheel um, of life. I, I wanted to relate Swastika. another, I wanted to relate another uh, a news article that I found because. I was kind of wanting to know more about this subject also. And I found a news article that said uh, um, some scientists um, basically gave semen uh, to these animals themselves and watched them. And they ended up living uh, 25% longer lives and more healthier uh, in, in, this, in the studies that they did. So, I mean when you talk about Nephilim from the Bible too, and how they were giant and stout men and strong. I mean, if, if these people were doing that, then they quite possibly could have been stronger and bigger uh, because of the system that they were still a part Mm of. And if you notice also a lot of what, what do monks do in uh, purification of self, it's celibacy. Number one, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, fasting it's prayer or whatever it is meditation but the main thing is always they need to uh, and i I believe the philosopher kings in republic plato's republic they 
weren't allowed to have any worldly possessions, but I'm not sure if they were allowed to have sex or not. I don't think they were able to have any pleasures at all because their whole thing was to dictate society. They were there to just rule and, you know, they couldn't benefit uh, money wise. They couldn't do anything because, and that makes a lot of sense. Cause if you look at the politicians now, they can pass laws and their buddy will put a couple bucks in their pocket and that's and they'll benefit from it. I love that idea of just stripping them away from everything and, you're just going to rule the world, bro. You're going to be a eunuch and you're just going to rule society. <laughs> and that's it. You know what I mean? You're not going to have any, any worldly pleasures, which makes a lot of sense. Dude, you we were talking about Game of Thrones. The eunuch is the spider making all the scheming behind the scenes. And who does he want to bring back? The Tartarian. I mean, the Targaryen girl, the blonde haired purple eyes in the book, blue eyed for our HBO fans. Uh, and it's yeah, it's it's it seems like the same story because you look at the Tartarians and the Targaryens, it's really the same as well. Well, there is again, Hollywood does draw inspiration from ancient cultures and all these things. We know this. Oh, yeah. You know, we the, the story of Star Wars is of one of like the force and all this stuff. And you have uh, Nietzsche talking about the for the the will to power, which is this inanimate thing that manifests itself differently within all of us. Do they have some sort of Bible or tablet that they have this creation story inscribed in at all? Because, you know, like the Mormons, they have the golden tablets that only one dude could read. And it said X, Y, and Z. Hmm. Is there anything like that for this? Do they have a Bible? Is there? They have an alphabet uh, that's 29 symbols that, that make 29 sounds. And these are what they consider pure sounds, I believe, where th the comparison this is a good one where it's like our first letter in English is a, but to them it's ah, mm. it's the same symbol, but it's ah. And the reason for that is they say that a is two sounds. It's ah and e. Interesting. So that's how pure or original these sound symbols represent. Uh, I recently talked to a guy on uh, his name's Ronnie on a, podcast called enlighten me and he's from finland and when i showed him the alphabet or as they call it the alphernus betten which <laughs> translates to either rhyme of the elves or rhyme of the all father um he said that that was basically his alphabet so it's and these languages do still exist today from what we're told from the box saga the bacchus they say that swedish people now sing this root language from long ago and the Finnish people speak a language that was originally known as Vonner language or Von language, because these concentric circles, you have the Acer people who are in the center, but these concentric rings have that structure for many, many reasons. Caste systems are born like that. They're the further out you go in the concentric circle, the, the different caste systems you get. And this was all part of their, their birthing system and, and how, how humanity was being put together. But yeah, it, it draws out like that. Interesting. Interesting. Cause again, my whole thing, I like to learn about a, a bunch of different creation stories just to have, I think that at the end of the day, we all have the right idea, but it's, you know, different pieces of the puzzle and the puzzles all com combobulated. And it's like, I think that Atlantis, Shambhala, Gartha, all these different places that they talk about, Hyperborea, all these different places, Mu, I think it's the same I co concept. But throughout the times, it's changed names, you know, from one hand to like the gods, like Veracosha, Cuckoo Khan, and, and Quetzalcoatl, they could have been the same guy. They could have been the same entity. One of the things that I heard the other day, I had some a gentleman on my podcast, uh, the wisdom tradition podcast, and he studies a lot of Manly Hall. And one of the things that he brought up that I had never really looked at it in this, in this way was that philosophy is a byproduct of the fall of Atlantis because we're trying to get back to be like Atlantis, to be enlightened like Atlantis. So therefore we have philosophy and I was like, wow, that's really interesting because if you really think about it, it I mean, it's an origin story for philosophy of why these people, right? Of course, Plato and Pythagoras were the first, 
you know, Pyth uh, Pythagoras was the first philosopher because before that they had sages. Sages knew the information. They weren't seeking it. So how could you run before you could walk? So then Pythagoras came. I was like, I don't know shit. So let me coin the term philosopher. I'm seeking the knowledge. It would have happened after the fall. You know what I mean? It's, all, it's a byproduct of it. And here, this is how you get these mystery schools and all these things. So I found that very interesting because I never looked at it from that way. And he also called Atlantis a point in time where, you know, it was in a fall of an actual. Because we like to, again, have physical beings to go behind a story. Like, oh, it needs to be a one place. It needs to exist. Mm. You know, I need to see the towers, the physical towers. But it could have been symbolic. It could have been a wide network of beings that they, you know, like the whole Tartaria thing. Because I, that's why I love the Tartarian cosmology because it's again it's following that same story there was this great civilization and then they eventually fell and here we have the remnants of them you know i always tell people this is my personal opinion i think that there's more evidence for tartaria than there is flat earth because you can see these fucking buildings they're out of place you can see them and people who are i can okay. uh I can link you afterwards. I, I couldn't, I don't know if I could find it right now, but um, there's a lot of reference in the box saga talk in regards to Tartaria and how we, how it gets there in the story. And we can do that phonetically. If you look at all the details too, it's pretty impressive and it makes sense too. And it, and the fall of Tartaria makes sense. It's like another dismantling of the old way in a way. Yeah. And it's Atlantis part two yeah uh or the three. box saga is atlantis part two you said <laughs> no tartaria no 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 oh oh, oh. Tartaria, yeah because yeah. it makes sense they were rebuilding back what was once or they took over the, mm -hmm. the old it was the only place at one point the only place in the you know in the northern hemisphere to survive so yeah they're trying to get back home they're trying to get back to that mm -hmm. first version and as above think... so low we are all doing that as well mm -hmm. In some way, I, I think Tartaria is kind of a, a, an inversion also because when you think of Tartaria, you think of uh, like the structures and everything, but the people that took it over. And Tartaria is is the civilization that existed before the takeover. But we always, I don't, I I kind of always think of it in the opposite way. I don't know if it's because it's presented that way or not, but uh, you know, it's it's the Catholics that end up taking over all these pagan uh, buildings and everything uh, that repurpose them and make them into churches and turn them into other things and, and use some of the same symbolism that they have. Why, why would freaking Catholics have gargoyles on the top of their churches? Obviously that's a pagan thing, not a Catholic thing. And why would they have all these other different symbolisms? Well, they left the symbolism in and changed other things. They changed, the, the semen rituals and the blood rituals and all this other stuff. So when we talk about like the bloodletting cults and who's, who's behind like the blood drinking shit, it's not the pagans, you know, it's these fucking Catholic fucking. Yeah. The cults. pagans are just sucking each other's dicks. The, the, the Catholics are the ones that want yeah, to exactly. kill people. <laughs> Yeah, they're just dicking around. Well, that's the interesting part of it, too, is that this the box saga points to this all being from one story. So if you can kind of condense time and look at it like a big family feud going on of ideological war, basically, mm -hmm. but it's all the same family. Which... So you're going to see a crossover in symbolism regardless. You know, it's weird seeing Lady Rockefeller with the big fucking goat around her neck and like all silver. Like that that doesn't represent sun well it does work Wait, is that a the thing, original bro? sun worship oh absolutely yeah, i'll pull yeah. a picture at some point but yeah there's uh actually i think i posted it at some what point what the fuck i saw you posted that yeah. andy has it posted on but Instagram. of course that just that just immediately goes to oh it's satanism it's yeah, it's lucifer everybody just throws these words into a blender and cooks up fear out of all these different but they don't understand that these enemies are still there mm. it's just the story is all fucked mm. up that doesn't mean they're not doing dark ritual magic shit, but the box saga and following this line through history, it's a, it's again, it's a return to home. It's a very earthly human story through and through. There's not a lot of metaphysics involved. 
other than kind of like what they gloss over. They were all smoking pot because the saga claims it's okay. Mm-hmm. So clearly they were probably getting out there, but there's not a lot of talk of that. It's all about how the society worked, how it was all structured. There's also where it all went. a, I've heard before, I can't recall where, but that the Eucharist in the Last Supper was actually Jesus' semen that he was serving to the disciples. I've heard that one before. Mm-hmm. Again, going back to this, semen aspect of the whole thing the and when you look at all these grimoires like it's all the same thing paracelsus his whole thing was you need to have a almost sort of the similar thing where it's like if you waste it anywhere that you throw your seed right we've all had that one sock or that rag you know Mm -hmm. growing up whatever where it could have possibly turned into a fucking homunculus at one point in time because it was just loaded up, right? So Paracelsus was like, yeah, wherever you leave your seed, you're going to grow a fucking human right there or whatever it was. So I have a Roe I have a Roe versus Wade towel. <laughs> what the fuck? So what the fuck? Yeah, it's fucked up. <laughs> so this idea of not <laughs> wasting it, you know, and again, there is such thing as retention and all these things. It goes back some ways. And most importantly, we have to keep in mind when it comes to these crazy religions all over the place, the ones that won are the ones that stick. Okay. So the, 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 when you look at the, the canonical versions of the, you know, the, of these biblical stories versus the Nag Hammadi and all these other places, you know, one is through a Roman lens that's been filtered and the other is like the non-filtered version. But which is right and which is wrong we don't fucking know but they keep pushing whatever wins the guys that kept winning they just kept pushing along and chugging along and chugging along and here we are today 2022 is it going to be the same thing a thousand years from now or are they going to find other evidence about like the box auger or something that further implements their story and gives it more credibility versus the other guy or well good there is the temple we haven't even really talked about the the lemonkinen temple lemonkinen is a character not just in the box saga but in a lot of finnish folklore um it's comprised in what's called the vinamonen mythology and this lemonkinen temple is this massive stone structure and this is supposedly where how do you spell it the box fi- uh l e m let me type it in and see if it starts coming up for me <laughs> yeah, yeah. m m lemon kind and let's see l e m m i n k a i n e n lemon kind got it temple yeah so this is where the box supposedly hid the last of their treasures and basically blocked the way into the temple like blew it up or something whatever they did back when the Catholics were supposedly coming for the rest of them to destroy them all. And they lived on, but they had to live out in hiding and all that. This Lemminkainen temple was a place where uh, it was in, it's in Finland and it, it was a place where from all over the world during paradise time, these other people from all the other ring lands would come back as like a pilgrimage and you see how pilgrimages go these days it's back to the north back to the homeland so they go back to this one original place in the north and they would pay homage to the the box as the original family and the uh and just the the all father and the original concentric ring culture so they would leave treasures and all kinds of things. And each generation had a, a gold uh, statue made of them uh, in this temple. So it, you go into this temple and there's a spiral staircase that goes down. And every level has more and more history and gold and all that. If it were real, it would be the next Nicolas Cage, uh, you know, national treasure. It would just be international, <laughs> international treasure. Because it's just, it would be the biggest treasure ever. And they're currently trying to dig it up and dig into it. And they're, they've been doing it since the late 80s. It's pretty intense. They have over 1,500 volunteers from all over the world uh, 
either, they're probably there now. They started in like late June or something like that. Each summer they come back. They all get together. The mainly it's called they the, have the to Temple open it Twelve. Honest. What's that? They have to open it on a certain day. In the summer, right? They're not allowed to go. They have to go in on like July twenty fourth or twenty sixth or something like that. It- they have to go. That's when they have to open the door. So even if they uncover everything, they have to wait until the following year that That's day right. to open it. It's the anniversary of when Eeyore released it to the world. Because he released it like July 24th, 1984 or something like that. Yeah, I'm looking here. It's funny. This lady yeah, that... says, I heard for the first time of Eeyore Box Saga a year ago from my dear friend and colleague Nina Porn. <laughs> The chick's last name is Porn. <laughs> That's fucked up. Sounds Scandinavian. Yeah. So it's got the little or oh with the two dots at the top. What is it? How do you put? Is that? Yeah, the umlau. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I wouldn't know, but no. it's. So in this cave Bjorn? is where they say that. Is it unimaginable treasures? Really, and the proof, basically the physical proof. So it's a very alluring story, regardless. There's a staircase like, well, that was. What found the hell's there? gonna happen? No, it's not found. It's a staircase. Told. It is told that that is there. It's told that all these treasures were taken there. It's told that it was all sealed up and hidden from the world. And that's when they announced to each other when the story was allowed to come back out. And I can imagine, since it was such a long time from 1050 to 1985, for even just a family to think about, it sounds like utter fear. Like it's going to take this long for it to be safe to come out. Or maybe it's because in that meantime, they've been playing their own game behind the scenes, trying to slowly bring paganism and the archaic revival kind of back into the mainstream. So it's interesting when you see like who's running the show and what mythologies we kind of cross over. Cause it seems like the other side is just trying to hijack all the paganism because they all grew up with it too. And they're like, no, 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 no. No, nope, no public, no dumbass public. No, this is what it means. And it's it's just the same force like Star Wars that they're all mm-hmm. fighting over and they're trying to like give the public their own version of it or something. But supposedly if this temple's unearthed or gone into finally, then it would supposedly give proof to all of it. And it's funny that I, I'm just still stuck on why they took so long to come out with it or why they even came out with it on its own you know like why they why even come out with it if you have all this fucking you know uh... because uh, yeah uh because they had to hide it they had to keep it hidden uh they had to keep the knowledge intact uh they they passed it down through the oral tradition uh if you look at like the old pros adas and the adas in general they were told with like a rhyming pattern and this was to keep the story intact so that they could keep it intact over a long period of time. Because if it rhymed, then it would make sense. If it doesn't rhyme anymore, then the story has been dissolved. So they told it in a specific way over and over again to each other. It took Yorbach 20 years to learn it from his, his mother and his aunt. And the reason why they're the ones telling him, in my opinion because it relates to the saga is that the women's were the keepers of like the knowledge and uh the mystical mystic stuff that's why that's where we get the word mystery so we we have history and mystery and that uh relates to the women and they're like the fortune tellers and the seers and uh the crystal balls and all that kind of stuff so they held on to that knowledge because they didn't want to get into the wrong hands they released it because they knew that the line was coming to an end eeyore bach was the last one and they wanted to give it to the world they wanted to give the history back to the world so that everybody could know the true history of the planet and so they told eeyore as a kid and let him uh have the story so that he could tell the story so that we could all know it was Jim, and, and then he passed away. He passed away in 2017, and he was the last of the Bach family. E- Eeyore Bach passed away in 2010. Jim Chesner passed oh, away 10. in 2000. Well, actually, no, he passed down to the 21. But yeah, but yeah. Eeyore Bach, 2010. Jim was just uh, like a guy. Re- it was 10. I thought it was. Like- 
later. Jim was a very Jim was a very good friend. Oh, he was mm. he was one of them. The he put the first shovel into Lemminkainen Temple. He dug the first. Okay, let's do it. He funded it for the first two years on his own dollar. Uh, he was from Hawaii. He was a he was a pot pot farmer. And he would just was became fascinated by the story that he heard from his friend. I believe it was Carl Borgen was his friend. And that's where he heard it from. So they teamed up. But yeah, Jim was a very important person. He's the one that makes made uh, rest in peace. He uh, made the documentaries on YouTube that you can find called Welcome to Hell with one L. Mm-hmm. Welcome to Altlantis, which is at a L T L A N T I S and welcome to Rajasthan. It's a three part documentary all about Udenma and the Acer people and the box. Saga. And he's taking you. He, yeah, I can send you those links, man. And he's taking you yeah. through the story and different aspects of the language and showing you other phonetic connections that'll blow your mind. But he's also showing you the language. He's got it you know, out on paper and he's going through it, but then he's taking to all these locations in Finland and other places that signify the story. You know, this supposed place where Udenma, you know, it was, is in Finland in Helsinki. There's like a big, you know, famous statue or something right where the, the, you know, the story happened and it's all just kind of written over with, Catholicism and stuff like that. So I'm on this guy's website, and I don't know how recent this is because yeah. it doesn't have a date or anything. But this is what I was telling you: breaking news, staircase found in the in the temple. Oh shit! Mm. That must be very. It doesn't have a date. I'll have to talk to him about. Oh, that. you guys know I, this guy? Because I, yeah, Carl Borgen. Yeah, so he's a very good friend of Michelle Merle and all the Bacchus. He was there for a long time. He was part of the Temple Twelve, the the people there, and he's written many books about it. So the Twelve now, disciples. I think he's on his fourth yeah oh yeah (laughs) but um this dig has been thwarted at times they were all thrown in jail at one time uh there was a shady um organization that claimed to be like kind of like a hippie organization it was called like the free people society or something like that I, i have it wrong there it's something along those lines and i've found it literally nothing on it just Jim talking about this it. shit goes deep, but, then. It's, but that as soon as they got involved in helping with the dig and funding it, that's when suddenly drug smuggling started showing up and, and everybody got arrested. So, and then the land was confiscated because this was Eeyore's property. It was given to him. So the, the, the reason why they were even allowed to be digging on this giant stone structure that they're calling a temple is because it was already on, Eeyore's mm. land yeah i kind of figured when i saw it that was there you know like the temple i kind of figured that it was his land because they're not going to be just digging in some some random <laughs> land this is you know again oh, it goes very deep this kind of reminds me of i was looking up the old newspaper articles and i for whatever reason i looked up like reptilians and again not saying that this is the case but this dude was talking about how in, on his land there was underneath, there was a civilization of reptilians, of like lizard people. But it was because he had bought the land and it was worth shit. So he wanted to like fluff up the the value of his land. So he came up with all these crazy stories of like lost artifacts and shit underneath his ground. So people could like go want to bite off of him. And I'm like, is is there really some fucking gold in this in this <laughs> cave somewhere? You know what I mean? Like, is it really some gold in there? We're not ever going to know. There's over 1,500 people think so, and they're helping out, you know, dig this summer. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, there's so reportedly over a million, quote unquote, Bacchus around the world. I don't even know if we were, where do we don't consider ourselves that. We just are fascinated by the story and, and how it connects yeah. to other things, you know? What parts of it can we draw a straight line from and to, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Interesting. So... Yeah, I don't. I'm. This shit goes deep, from what I could tell. <laughs> Obviously, in an hour and a half, we're not going to cover everything. But no, this is just to whet people's appetites. Mm, I would say. Yeah, I would love to have you guys back on to continue the. You know, I need to start doing some more research, apparently, and that's why when Dan sent it to me, I'm like, man, 
I don't have time for these rabbit holes. You know what I mean? <laughs> it feels like another rabbit hole at this point. No, oh, come on, you know. I want to. I want to give you another uh, good rabbit hole to go down right. because I, I I think this is fascinating because I've listened to a lot of like the Shakespearean mysteries, and it's like there's this swan song type thing, and the swan is connected to like the female, the goddess who gives. Uh, she's the one that gives birth. It's the swan. S V A N. Yeah. And that's the swan. And so when you see all this bird mythology and everything and it giving life and taking life, right? Because there's a mythology about birds like being the stork and bringing life into existence. And there's also stories about birds taking the soul uh, back into the uh, whatever, the void or whatever, the, the, the soul Rising collector the or whatever. Yeah, whatever you. <laughs> so. You have a lot of this bird mythology. And then uh, Andrew Collins wrote that book, The Cygnus Key. And he actually says that the, the the pyramids of Giza actually closely more align to the three stars of the wing and Cygnus, which is the bird, the swan. Interesting. So, yeah, instead of Orion's belt. So there's another interesting road to go down there. I'm wondering how that changes a lot of the other aspects that we all kind of go by because we all kind of just assume Orion's belt. But what if it is the Cygnus and the the Cygnus key is the key to unraveling all this? Uh, A lot of the stuff in Shakespeare also points to Cygnus as being something. So uh, again, and then you get into John D and then Shakespeare and all that shit. I mean, that all connects <laughs> again too. So I mean, uh, that's a, what I can't read. So that. it says Andrew Sorry. Collins, the Cygnus key, and I, I put holding heads because I heard you on. I forgot which podcast it was when you guys were talking about it. You said that this the symbolism behind the holding of the skull is to signify pretty mm-hmm. much that you know the mortality of man. You know, which, which, until, until which. The reason why they cut the heads off. Oh, yes, yes. People. It was because of that. Can you talk about that? Because, yeah. oh, fuck, man. Because this, this relates to something completely different that I'm fucking working on. And it was, I had wrote that down because <laughs> I wanted to check that book out. And then now you bring it up. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, check out Andrew Collins. He does a much better job than I do. But the cutting of the head is because the soul resides in in the head. Mm-hmm. And so they would carry that around just like the Knights Templar carried around the head of John the Baptist, right? Or whatever. And uh it, it wasn't really like a uh, like a scary thing. It was more of like they're trying to keep his energy with them. That's kind of how like, how I look at it. Is they're trying to have that connection still with him. That's kind of why like who they put JFK's brain in a fat skull of water and bones, or whatever it is, or... is that wanted to? Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, so it, it's more of uh, to tap into that consciousness or something. Um, and then holding it hostage means that it can't it can't get recycled. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, I was on with ex- so there could be a nefarious aspect to it and a good aspect to it so it just depends upon the story yeah because i was on with exertus all our words and uh he brought up the idea that skull and bones before one of their members dies they take this psychedelic concoction and hold the skull to transfer their their consciousness into it and again the the templars Mm -hmm. with with baphomet uh and the ancient egyptian belief that a, a head of a prophet prophesizes to you and then you have again Geronimo, because Geronimo was magical. You know, he had uh, what was it, the the powers or something like that, the, the the force or some crazy shit where he was invincible and all this stuff. So by having a piece of that, you know, by having the, the uh, a piece of a saint, you know, you're sort of blessed in a way. So we see that a lot, and I just found that really interesting because there is there is a i don't know if it's freemasonic or which it is but that the frontal sinus is where the soul resides it's where this gaseous material is and you're saying mm-hmm. the soul does reside in the head you know so it would make sense that they hold the head also signifies to what level they could get to so i could you know i could get to this you know and what is it the uh, is it a shakespeare play where he's like uh to be or not to be hammer or, yeah hammer yeah, exactly hammer. mm-hmm 
where he has the fucking skull he's looking mm-hmm. at and all this shit. So it's, again, I found that really interesting. I'm going to check that book out. Have you guys had this guy on? I think he's kind of. You should. Check. It's uh, I I hit him up to be on our show. Uh, he he got back to me a, a long time ago and told me to wait till his book came out, and now his book's out. So I've been trying to get him uh on the show, but uh, yeah, uh, his book is on Audible, The Sickness Key. Uh, I recommend listening to it at least. It's uh, especially for podcasters and people listening to podcasts. It's a great way to take mm-hmm. in the information. Mm-hmm. And I would also recommend people go on Amazon and check out Box Saga, an introduction by Carl Borgen, because that's going to be a much more detailed account uh, from Carl's perspective, yeah. who is a very close friend. Completely layered. He also has another uh, book out. Oh, what's the name of that? Andy? Squatters Gang. No. He's got The Squatters Game. He's got um, The End of Paradise, which is a fictionalized version of what like not a fictional, but like he puts, you know, he puts characters involved and he, you know, puts you into it like a movie into the paradise time and, and that time period of losing the paradise and going towards the ice time. Um, yeah. Squatters gang, it, box saga introduction, uh, temporarily, temporarily insane. insane, temporarily insane. That's the one all about Eeyore and a lot of his times with them and, and, Eeyore's death it's uh it's a it's a yeah it's a great book it's it's Carl Borgen's basically personal journey through all these different times with the box saga and all the different uh his feelings his emotions throughout the whole thing other people's feelings and emotions yeah Uh, he he kind of goes back and forth between other people's accounts of what they saw and felt during that time and it kind of gives you a different sense of what was going on in in that time period and it's it's pretty interesting very good book and he talks he he brings box saga into a lot of the aspects of the storytelling it's very well done um i enjoyed it uh so that's on audible also and then yeah there's there's not a lot of copies out there but i've seen a couple rares being sold here and there there's this book by a man named cliff Shit, I'm going to forget. Cliff Barber. Mm. And he was a mathematician. Mm -hmm. Mathematician and a yoga instructor. (laughs) And he met Eeyore Bach in Goa, India, where he was like a... I guess this guy for quite a while in that that culture was like a a international sensation kind of yoga teacher guy. But met Eeyore, life transformed. And as a mathematician, basically his entire life after the saga after getting interested in that and learning about it he lived in a yurt by himself endlessly drawing all these mathematical geometrical uh things out of what he found in the root language and how it was set up and it's interesting because they do say that it the the way the wheel of the alphabet is set up and how the north pole was set up and how they they found mathematics through it. This guy was able to like correlate the root language alphabet and the setup of it to the flower of life. Interesting. It's pretty nuts. And it's very, it's rare footage you can find on YouTube, like VHS. It's old. I want to throw another thing at you Juan, (laughs) uh, because I think you might find this interesting because you like to get into the occult stuff Mm -hmm. is that if, Atlantis is at the North Pole and the world is in balance. Then it's at the 90 degree arc and it's the nine. So you often have this nine representation throughout everything. I think that is a representation of Atlantis and the number of that. And it's also the right angle, right? Mm -hmm. So you get the compass and the square, the circle and the square yeah. You also have 33, which uh, it's the closest full number to how many degrees the Earth supposedly tilted in the box saga. And 33 being a number. Well, that... uh, tw- it's like 32.67 no, or something. No, 20. Like- 23.4. Oh, was it? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I take that yeah, back. I think it's 23. It's 23.4. <laughs> it's 23.4, and then the rest of it is 66.6. Or six hundred and sixty six. Oh, okay. Whatever. Oh, how about yeah. that? Oh, I was gonna say thirty three <laughs> yeah. is obviously 
I knew there was some creepy connection. Six 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 better. Yeah, sixty six point six is is what's left over of a ninety degree angle if you have a twenty three degree tail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So six 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 is a human number, right? It's the number right. of the beast. Yeah, and the number of a man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but again, this is all recycled shit from all religions, I believe, and I do think that there was a root. And it was a, a game of telephone since the very beginning of time. And when now and we got the the zombie Jew that came out of a cave and three days later. <laughs> so it started with like this crazy fucking st- pantheon of gods and it got down to one dude. So we'll see. They always talk about Mount Olympus and always being 12. I think that these 12 Olympian gods always represented uh, places in the sky, planets and stars and moon, sun, whatever. And when one would go away or new age would come, they would just change them into a different, the next person's time would come and they would put them in. And so you, when you talk about like Satan and some of these other terms, you know, they're actually just titles. They're not actually depicting a person. It's like, uh, that person's title like a general or an uh what is it uh, what's an, a chieftain or whatever that they, they have different other names but that's like their title at that time and so they just kind of rotate back and forth in and out but and through the different religions but what they're really depicting is what's going on in the sky and mm-hmm. you can see that in the saga too it talks about the same thing because the first son is the moon and the king and he's the one that rules and the last son is the uh the last son is the progenitor and the son and he's the one that procreates and if you look at the stars it's the same thing right mm-hmm. the sun is the one procreating the the and the moon is the one that rules because it's out all the time interesting guys we got to do this mm-hmm. more often i want to have you guys back on again <laughs> i'm going to start looking yeah into- we can get all into egypt too and all the connections there and we can talk about jesus oh, in the box Cause, saga because he's part yeah, of i it. realize i fucked up uh like pike ha- halfway through this because i was like man this is actually a lot deeper than i i thought it was like a quick <laughs> 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 quick little story then i'm like wait a minute there's a fucking cave and we told me about the fucking cave <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we definitely gotta do this again after i do some homework and we'll do like a part two and until we get through the whole because i find it fascinating i think it's it's fascinating and i like to, it's very fascinating because yeah. it's a different take on the that's why i like the the Gnostic cosmology so much because it's a different take on it and you always pick something up when you're learning about and especially this that gets into mm-hmm. language and, and i've always said that the alphabet has been corrupted because yeah. I think it's a way to demystify us and, and take away our, our, our magical powers. I do think it's magical. I don't know. You said that this is not so much magical. It's more like a human type of thing. or just... It is, but when you think about the naturalistic way and what science is discovering now about like... The truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. With... yeah, man, it is magic. And I, I think a lot of people think that if science can like touch it even a little bit, then it, it, it's just, oh, it's not magic. Well, all right. Well, where's your perspective? You know, it's the most magical part of life that we know mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, right? This is, exactly. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful thing. And we're always chasing that one next thing. I have a conspiracy yeah. that, right? Because when we were kids, they always told us like, oh, use your, use your imagination, you know, use your imagination, use your imagination. What do you want to be when you grow up? You can be whatever you want to you be when you grow up. And then now it's like, fucking grow up, Dan. You know what I mean? Like, like face the fucking facts, dude. You know what I mean? Like, wake up and smell the roses. Like, it's time to do something with your life. Like, they don't tell you, use your imagination and manifest your own reality. They go, no, nah, dude, you're a fucking cog in the system now. If you choose to be, and you're going to fucking walk this line, because, again, that's what they're here for, to indoctrinate you and take that mystification away from you by implementing a new language, suppressing you with all these frequencies all the fucking time. And that's essentially that's I think that's the false prison. How Ike talks about it's, it's not the one that you can touch and feel. It's the, the the one that's bad is where you feel like you're free, but you're actually in a fucking mental prison. So 
Yeah. It's, yeah, it's the indoctrinational prison. It's uh, it's it's what you're told prison. Mm-hmm. It's not finding out the answers and seeking for yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean that's definitely what we're in. we're in this clandestine era or time period where like before the reason why there was physical slavery so much more so is because the truth was exoteric. Mm-hmm. And it was like, yeah, these are the the gods, the you know, those that are good within that understand the universe and everything and we're, there's the slave race like it was much more divided in that sense because it was just so much more exoteric now it's yeah and uh, hidden. i would say that people that find any of this interesting to go buy the book definitely because it gets into so much more deeper like history it connects like the goths and the gauls back to back to Udin Ma and back to the Atlantis time. It, it connects all these different places back. Uh, like you, when you start reading it and you just start seeing it and seeing the words and the puns and the words, and it's just so, it's so hard to just be like, ah, this is such crap, but you really have to let yourself get past all the D jokes and everything <laughs> like that in it. And just, just think about it as like this is like the beginning of a homo sapien whatever species and they're starting out from birth basically and trying to figure things out and it's the process that they go through till we get to now you know what i mean and so you have to think of it as as like a growing up period this is thousands millions who knows how long ago uh i I always thought it was millions. That yeah, I think you might be right. Longer, but, but so this is like a long, long process of f- humans figuring things out for themselves and a very, very, very long game of telephone. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, when, the Catholic when, invasion you know, is we, kind of like a, a, a very confused dividing line where they're trying to, you know, they always claim that that's where our morals come from. This is what makes us human in in the correct way. And of course, you know, you justify it by, you know, saying that comes from God, then great. Well, that's yeah. fine and everything. But outside of those morals, which I don't, you know, I, I don't, I'm not outside of, I don't think. And all of this is very strange to me too. But outside of that moral standard that we've all been raised in for thousands of years, perhaps, you know, there is life outside of that. And there's that organic Like you said, Dan, the growing up period where Mm -hmm. if you as a human being, I don't know if you guys have taken acid, but it's like if you're seeing everything for the first time again, what's the most fascinating thing about your body? And especially when nature confirms, oh, yeah, buddy. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. Like what's going to happen? You know, so it's like you're literally talking about this very organic human experience of what's important. Oh, this thing makes Mm -hmm. more humans like all. All that, all those stereotypes, the reason for fertility cults, the reason why we worship the fact that we can do it. Yeah, I want to I want to bring that up too, like this idea of civilization and naturalness, uh, because it's civilization that's you know capitalizing on our reality, our perspective, and that's imprisoning us. Uh, I so you brought up like Gilgamesh earlier. And look at that story and look at like what happened to Enkidu. He was seduced by a goddess uh, and he was just a a regular hairy man from the woods. And then he got seduced and then he got made (laughs) part of the society. Right. That's. Yeah. That's the seduction, dude. It's the seduction. Oh, you made me think of. And and it's weird, too, because you got we we tend to polarize everything and it's like evil versus good or old versus new and it's like there's kind of a little good on both sides and a little bad on both sides you know Mm -hmm. but there are polarizing sides it seems Mm -hmm. maybe it was one family but it's like this very opposing philosophical war going on yeah you made me think of like harry man you made me think of like the monkey you know what i mean like was was that the (laughs) monkey and then you know uh uh, (laughs) the goat and the exactly so and then that she got yeah, exactly yeah. so it makes me think of that shit where it's like weren't they wrestling naked or some some mm-hmm. you know gay shit you know yeah 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 no it was a female and a male and 
Oh, oh, yeah. Well, because he came out of the woods and he had to stop Gilgamesh from. Basically, it's like the first thing he's like, "Yo, let's just... wrestle, bro." What, what do you mean? Like, let's <laughs> yeah. fucking wrestle. Let's go at it like right now. You know what I mean? So they start wrestling. I can imagine that they were naked. Well, because they were both very, they were both very big in stature, and and uh, and Enkidu was the one that could keep Gilgamesh at bay because he was going around and. and banging these women before they got married so was, he has ruined their pureness bloodline uh so it was a problem yeah it's a problem because basically this is like the story of the gods right they they go and they fertilize all this shit and uh and bail out oh what happened with the jesus story is that somewhat the same i don't know <laughs> yeah you can't well, Can't say that. according to Saga, Jesus was like a messenger from the Acer to say, like, "Hey, mm-hmm. the old ways back." Yeah, yeah, a, a messiah <laughs> yeah. was coming to. Yeah, left. yeah. To... I think Yake, mm-hmm. our call, our co-host on Roots of Creation, I think he's he's broken down that word messiah a couple times in root mm. language and stuff. It's pretty pretty fascinating because they, they all tell a story. All these little words that we say, it's not just that. It's like, language, good morning. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it really is. It's more than just this kind of like word magic stuff. It, no, but it's exactly it breeds, that, dude. It, goes, it's a, it is, it, and it goes right into the fact that puns are quote unquote the lowest form of humor. It's like yeah, because then people will start using phonetics mm-hmm. more and maybe getting back to that pre Tower of Babel mentality where everybody was speaking one language, <laughs> and then something came in and destroyed that and took that tower down yeah sounds a lot like the fall of Uden yeah as well. yeah exactly because like i've always said that like there's words that mean two separate things so it's taking away from the power that that word has because we know that there is such thing as magical formula you know like magical words and phrases and all these things and by adding you know tagging things along onto it i think you take the power away from that it originally had so absolutely mm-hmm. i believe in all that shit mm-hmm yeah, you can kind of take certain words and, you know, take their two separate meanings and then kind of try to root them back to when those two words would make sense together. And the, the only way to do that is really to know the root language and the story surrounding it and all the symbols. And you start going, oh, OK, so it's not two different meanings. It's pointing to mm. a little bit like a little chunk of mythology with the two very different meanings. I wish I could give you an example, but I've had that like, holy crap, a few times when getting into the saga. <laughs> so like, I promise you, you read any of the sites you've probably pulled up enough, especially Carl Borgen's site, carlborgen.com. You can get a ton of details and a lot of like, the kind of, it hits you in the stomach, the the connections and the phonetic words and everything. You're like, ooh, okay. That could just be a silly thing someone made up. But then if I take all this in and look at all these other parts of history oh shit it's still no matter what i do it still Mm -hmm. fucking harkens back Mm -hmm. to this damn story the immune system the The honeymoon system (laughs) yeah the moon being the mouth shape and yeah e being the the penis Penis. (laughs) because the lowercase i is a rod and a dot right and (laughs) The dot is the tip of the penis. Of course. No, yeah, again, it's... it's <laughs> I, we could go on and on. That, I, that's why I would love to have you guys back on so we could really take a deep dive after I've done my research because I haven't done shit. And again, like I said, it's... Yeah, it's good to have oh, questions, you, man, for sure. You had, you, so more long, questions, one. you had so long, You had so long. I didn't know it was so complex, all right, bro? And I'm working on 30 different <laughs> projects at the same time. I feel like And you, I don't man. know why I do it. Like, I'm like... Yeah yeah we should do an episode on this and like i'm writing like five other episodes like yeah dude totally we should do an episode on that shit it's like oh let's do it you know in two weeks or whatever and then i wait till the very last minute or whatever so anyways it's hard it's hard just think about think about all this while you're doing research and stuff well, and yeah with other topics pop into yeah, your the brain. Anakian language yeah. like that right there 21 letters it's shorter than our regular alphabet it's the 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 first language of adam you know the the creational language it was the, the first came the word you know the tetragrammaton and all this stuff it mm-hmm. does remind me of other things that i'm looking into at the same time and it makes a lot of sense like yeah that might be an interesting angle to get into sometime you should definitely look into that connection with the enochian words and all that yeah because who knows what mythology connections we might mm-hmm. make well guys i think this went great uh this was 
Thanks for having us. This was man. like the tip of the yeah, dick, the, the the dot on the eye of Box Saga. <laughs> yeah. The E. <laughs> it goes deep. We go deep. Can you guys plug your stuff? And Andy, send me those those documentaries. I want to check those out. Yeah, absolutely. I go deep on the deep share. So come get deep with me. Not in a gross, weird, pagan sexual way, just a normal way. And talk about weird stuff. I talk a lot <laughs> about like my psychedelic experiences. I try to relate a lot of stuff to that and everything. So I have fun over there. Do a lot of random interviews and everything. So hit me up on there, the deep share on all the social platforms. And all that. Yeah. Thanks again for having me yeah, on. Yeah, dude. Email me your links. And Dan, can you play your stuff real quick for the listeners? Yeah, if you've heard uh, the homie Romy on your on one show before which I'm sure you guys all have. He's my co-host on Rising from the Ashes, and we do theme months, and uh, we're currently finishing up uh, Synchro Mystic Month, and we're going to be going into Norse Month in July, and that's so far uh, pretty awesome because we've already recorded one. And uh, it's fucking phenomenal. So um, if you like the deep dives, go check out our show. And uh, we get deep over there, too. Even though we're not the deep share, we keep it for ourselves. <laughs> and then we got the deep chill, which is me and Dan <laughs> together. And that's on both of our Patreons. Mm-hmm. So that's, and that's on Patreon. Know. We we talk a little bit more about Box Saga on there. We, we kind of broke down the Atlantis story a little bit. Oh, and yeah. now we're going to start uh, bringing more of, like, the different mythologies into it. Uh, we wanted to lay a base of the Box Saga for people to understand. Now we're going to start overlapping these different um like ovid and uh the adas and all these other different mythologies and and even contemporary people that talk about atlantis that put atlantis in the north pole and all these other different ideas that people have just to give the saga more uh cooperation and uh and really try to flesh out some of these ideas we're also looking for people that think we're all stupid and yeah. so we can have a discussion and not just not an argument. We're not looking for arguments, but we're looking for people that have other evidence to suggest otherwise, or maybe that some of this stuff doesn't make sense. And that's also welcome and accepted because we not, aren't really saying like, this is the end all be all. We're no. trying to figure it out and see if all the pieces fit ourselves, and to see if it's something deeper than that. And if it's something that should be more known or if we're just, spinning our own wheels you know we don't know is it a but history that is, should be buried huh? <laughs> you know, who yeah knows? this is it's the process of processing any information now you know we're just looking for the history of it we're not saying that believe this yeah so. we want more eyes on it that's what i always say we want more people just observing it and the more they know it the more questions they can have about it you know, it, it just helps all of us to figure out what's going on in our past. And I think that's, again, as above, so below the, the individual that goes and faces all his demons from his past can finally move on. Well, obviously, we need to figure out what the fuck happened to us before we can really move on, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think we're doing that. I think it's happening. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, the theologian said that we're uh, coming into a new axial age where there's going to be an awakening and people are going to realize and cut through the bullshit and see it and realize it and have an awakening. So absolutely guys, this was great. We should do it again very soon. And thank you so much for coming on.